Father God, we thank you that we have the light of your word to give us hope, to give us understanding, and to give us clarity as to who you are. It's my prayer that the grace and the power of your Holy Spirit would be with us as we not only open your word, but as we open our hearts to you. Anoint these lips and may the good news be proclaimed in this great assembly. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. I want to first of all welcome all of you, and that includes our folks who are watching on uh, YouTube and uh, the, the internet and all of those platforms that are out there. We certainly really appreciate your attendance and joining us, and so we're grateful to have you with us here today. The message today is, what is the greatest reset? I ask that question because, admittedly, this is a play on words. You may have heard the phrase that has now been circulating on the Internet in particular, and it's called the Great Reset. Anybody ever heard of the Great Reset? Okay, there's a few of you here. And, but to find out what the greatest reset is, we first need to consider for a moment the question, what is the Great Reset? And according to Michael Rechtenwald, the Chief Academic Officer for American Scholars, the Great Reset is an idea that purports to rectify the weaknesses of capitalism that were exposed during COVID-19, during the pandemic. This comes from the book COVID-19, The Great Reset, written by Klaus Schwab. You can see his picture there uh, up on the screen. The founder and director of the World Economic Forum, an organization consisting of the world's political, economic, and cultural elites, and they meet in Davos, Switzerland every year. And it was also co-written by Terry Malaret, the co-founder and authority of the Monthly Barometer. Now, if you were to Google the Great Reset, they have a landing page for this, and their website states that there is an urgent need for global stakeholders to cooperate in simultaneously managing the direct consequences of the COVID-19 crisis to improve the state of the world. The World Economic Forum is starting the Great Reset Initiative. Now, some have concerns because they see a grand conspiracy of individuals, many who are not elected to public office, setting policy that's going to impact millions of people around the world, including you and I. Now, whether one believes it's a conspiracy or not, the fact remains, as well-intentioned as it may be, the Great Reset is simply an attempt by mankind to save himself from the economic and social perils that he has gotten himself into. Does that make sense? From a biblical perspective, and we always want to be able to look at the world through the lens of Scripture. From a biblical perspective, mankind cannot save himself. Okay? We are incapable of accomplishing that task, no matter how hard we try. Now, why can I say that? Well, the biblical perspective demonstrates that mankind has repeatedly tried to save himself. And every time he tries to do that, it ends up in failure. So, I want us to take a look a little closer at answering the question, what is the greatest reset? You know, the first great reset attempted by mankind on a universal scale took place at a place called the Tower of Babel. And this story is found in the book of Genesis, Genesis chapter 11 in particular, but I want to do a little bit of backtracking. I want to start just real quick here in Genesis chapter 8. And it says that the Bible tells us after the flood, Noah's ark settled on the mountains of Ararat. And you can see the text that's written there. Then the ark rested in the seventh month on the 17th day of the month on the mountains of Ararat. And after Noah and his family left the ark, God instructed Noah and his family to resettle the earth. Now you can see on the map 
On the right-hand side, you've got the Caspian Sea over there on the upper right, and just to the left of it is the mountains of Ararat. And, you know, it's more of a cartoonish-type map, but nonetheless, it serves the purpose to just give us a general idea. But over there, you can see the, where the Ark settled in that region of the world, and then the people started to resettle the earth. Noah and his sons uh, were commissioned to go out and repopulate the earth. And it says here in Genesis chapter 1, 9, So God blessed Noah and his sons and said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. But as the families made their exodus from the region of the ark, instead of being obedient to the command of God, the people chose to gather and settle on the plain of Shinar. And that's described in Genesis chapter 11, verse 1. It says, Now the whole earth had one language, and one speech, and it came to pass as they journeyed from the east that they found a plain in the land of Shinar and they dwelt there. So if you just go on your map down to the lower section, just up to the upper left of the Persian Gulf, you can see where the tower, well, they have Babylon over there described, but that's the general region of where the Tower of Babel is believed to have been built or they, where they started to build it. But in doing so, they chose to build themselves a city and a tower. The text says, Then they said to one another, Come, let us make bricks and bake them thoroughly. They had brick for stone, and they had asphalt for mortar. But, the, the text goes on, it says, Then they said, Come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower whose top is in the heavens. Let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be scattered abroad over the face of the whole earth. Now, Case in point, God had already assured Noah's family that there would never be another flood to destroy the earth. Genesis chapter 8, verse 21, Then the Lord said in his heart, I will never again curse the ground for man's sake, although the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth, nor will I again destroy every living thing as I have done. So, should we ever be worried about a flood and the, wa the ocean waters rising to destroy everybody on planet Earth? No, we have that assurance from God. In addition to God's word, he gave a sign. And this sign is described in several passages. I've chosen Genesis chapter 9, verse 16. It reads, I set my rainbow in the cloud, and it shall be for the sign of the covenant between me and the earth. And I will remember my covenant, which is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh. The waters shall never again become a flood to destroy all flesh. So God, in addition to his promise, gave mankind a sign that he would never destroy the earth again. And that was the rainbow. But... Instead of accepting these promises by faith, man chose to reset God's agenda for the human race. Okay? Genesis chapter 11, verse 4. I read it to you earlier. I'll read it again. They said, come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower whose top is in the heavens. Let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be scattered abroad over the face of the whole earth. Now, while the Bible reveals many attempts of man to save himself, both on an individual scale as well as a corporate scale, a universal scale, and this could be anything from economic salvation to spiritual salvation, okay? The Bible also reveals something else, and I'd like to talk to you about that. The Bible shows us that God has been trying to save mankind. You see, God did not stand idly by when man attempted his first great reset. The Bible says God confused the language of the people, causing them to scatter. Genesis chapter 11, verses 5 through 7, But the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the sons of men had built. And the Lord said, Indeed, the people are one, and they all have one language, and this is what they will do now. Now nothing what they propose to do will be withheld from them. Come, let us go down there and confuse their language that they may not understand one another's speech. 
So the Lord scattered them abroad from there over the face of all the earth, and they ceased building the city. Now God did this not to be spiteful to them, but because man's plan was interfering with God's plan to save mankind. God will give us choice to do things, but up to the point where if it interferes with his plans, then he has to intervene, okay? And this was one of those examples where God says, you know, uh, your plans, you're trying to set your own agenda. And so he confused the languages. Now, the story goes on from here that Genesis chapter 11, verse 27, we're introduced to an individual by the name of Abram. And here's how it begins. This is the genealogy of Terah. Terah begot Abram, Nahor, and Haran. Haran begat Lot. And Haran died before his father, Terah, in his native land in Ur of the Chaldeans. Then Abram and Nahor took wives. The name of Abram's wife was Sarai, but Sarai was barren. She had no child. And you can see this region again uh, on the next slide here. You can see the map. Uh, Ur of the Chaldees is right, uh, it's that little city cartoon drawing right up next to the tip of the Persian Gulf there, just below Babylon. So it, the text goes on to tell us in Genesis 11, verse 31, And Terah took his son Abram and his grandson Lot, the son of Haran, and his daughter-in-law Sarai, his son Abram's wife. And they went out with them from Ur of the Chaldeans to go to the land of Canaan. And they came to Haran and dwelt there. But then in Genesis chapter 12, we're introduced to a specific mission that God had for Abram. And here's what it says, Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 to 3. Now the Lord said to Abram, Get out of your country and from your family and from your father's house to a land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great. And you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and I will curse him who curses you. And in you all the families of the earth will be blessed. Abram was 75 years old when God gave this call to him, and he was childless. The Bible had tell, told us earlier that Sarai, his wife, was without child. But over time and generations, God fulfilled his promise to Abraham, and his family grew. But when a famine laid hold of the region in the providence of God, Joseph, one of Abraham's 12 great-grandsons who became the prime minister of Egypt, was able to make a way for Jacob, his father, and Joseph's siblings, along with their families, to find refuge in the land of Egypt. During this crisis, Pharaoh granted Jacob and his family permission to settle in the land of Goshen. And Goshen became the incubator for the nation of Israel. But over time, the Pharaoh who was kind to Jacob and his family went to his rest. And a new Pharaoh rose to the throne whom the Bible says did not know Joseph. Over time, the children of Israel increased in number. And out of fear of their strength, the new Pharaoh chose to deal very shrewdly with them. And what he ended up doing was he enslaved them as a people. The Bible says that this enslavement was harsh, and Pharaoh made the lives of the children of Israel bitter with hard bondage. It was during this affliction the children of Israel cried out to God for de deliverance, and this affliction lasted for hundreds of years. But this deliverance from slavery did not come without a struggle. God heard their prayers and raised up Moses to lead his people out of slavery. And when Moses went to Pharaoh to seek the release of the children of Israel, Pharaoh refused. After Pharaoh rejected Moses' demand, Moses called down a plague upon Egypt, and Pharaoh repented. And Moses rescinded the plague, only to have Pharaoh reject Moses' request, and the whole sequence started all over again. 
This went on for nine plagues, each one more destructive than the previous one, until the tenth plague, the death of the firstborn, was announced. In this plague, the firstborn of every household was subjected to the penalty of death. From the firstborn of Pharaoh to the firstborn of the female servant and all the firstborn of the animals, there was only one way of escape that God had given to Moses and his people. This was to prepare a meal, and this meal was to include the sacrifice of a lamb with the blood of the lamb placed over the two doorposts and the lintel of the house where the meal was served. All the lives of the firstborn who were under the roof with the blood on the doorposts were spared, whereas all those who were not under the protection of the blood were ensnared by death. And thus the Passover meal was initiated. And after 430 years, the children of Israel were free from Egyptian bondage. So, how does this telling of this ancient biblical drama help answer the question as to what is the greatest reset? Well, the greatest reset, not the great reset, but the greatest reset, I believe it's God's answer to man's biggest dilemma. And that dilemma is this. How do we conquer death? How do we conquer our greatest enemy, which is death? You see, the Passover meal and experience for the children of Israel was a type or a model. It was a teaching device that God had instituted to instruct God's people as to not only how to escape Egyptian slavery, because there would be a plague on Egypt and, and all of that, but in time, it was going to be a teaching moment to foreshadow the work and the ministry of Jesus on Calvary's cross. Let me explain. The Bible records that Jesus partook of the Passover meal. Mark chapter 14, I read this passage last week when we celebrated the Lord's Supper. Now on the first day of unleavened bread, when they killed the Passover lamb, his disciples said to him, where do you want us to go and prepare that you may eat the Passover? And he sent out two of his disciples and said to them, go into the city and a man will meet you carrying a pitcher of water. Follow him. Wherever he goes in, say to the master of the house, the teacher says, where is the guest room in which I may eat the Passover with my disciples? Then he will show you a large upper room furnished and prepared. There make ready for us. So his disciples went out and came into the city and found it just as he had said to them. And they prepared the Passover. And when they partook of that meal, Jesus instituted what we now call the Lord's Supper. Mark chapter 14, beginning in verse 22, it says, And as they were eating, Jesus took bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to them and said, Take, eat, this is my body. Then he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and they all drank from it. And he said to them, This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many. Assuredly, I say to you, I will no longer drink of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. Now, following the supper, Jesus went out to pray. He was arrested, was mocked and beaten, and he was put on trial, and he was crucified. Mark chapter 15 describes the final moments of Jesus. It says, when the sixth hour had come, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, saying, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which is translated, My God, my God, 
Why have you forsaken me? Some of those who stood by when they heard that said, Look, he's calling for Elijah. Then someone ran and filled a sponge full of sour wine and put it on a reed and offered it to him to drink, saying, Let him alone. Let us see if Elijah will come and take him down. And Jesus cried out with a loud voice and breathed his last. Then the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. So when the centurion who stood opposite him saw that he cried out like this and breathed his last, he said, truly, this man was the Son of God. The purpose of instituting the Lord's Supper was to remember what Jesus accomplished for us through his death. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 26, the Apostle Paul says, For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. Through the death of Jesus, my sins, my personal rebellion against God and his government can be forgiven. Your sins, your rebellion, our sins, our rebellion against God's government can be forgiven and we are assured by God's word, by confessing our sins to Jesus and accepting his death on our behalf, death will pass over us, just as it did for the children of Israel over 3,000 years earlier. Now, here's an appropriate statement to underscore this point. Desire of Ages, page 25. Christ was treated as we deserve, that we might be treated as he deserves. He was condemned for our sins in which he had no share, that we might be justified by his righteousness in which we had no share. He suffered the death which was ours, that we might receive the life which was his. With his stripes, we are. Heal. Amen is right. Amen is right. The scripture reading for today focuses on what took place after this. Mark chapter 16, verses 1 through 7 says, Now when the Sabbath was passed, Mary, Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome bought spices that they might come and anoint him very early in the morning on the first day of the week. They came to the tomb when the sun had risen, and they said amongst themselves, Who will roll away the stone from the door of the tomb for us? That was a dilemma. They merely wanted to go there just to anoint him, to finish what they couldn't because the Sabbath was drawing on and they had to go home and rest. They wanted to finish preparing the body. But there was one thing that stood in their way, and that was the door of the tomb was present. It sealed the tomb. There was no way to get into the tomb because there was this large stone that stood in the way, indicating that the dead were behind that door. But the text doesn't stop there. It goes on. But when they looked up, they saw that the stone had been rolled away. For it was very large. And entering the tomb, they saw a young man clothed in a long white robe, sitting on the right side. And they were alarmed. And he said to them, do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He is risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him? But go, tell his disciples and Peter that he is going before you into Galilee. There you will see him as he said to you. Friends, this passage describes God's greatest reset. Death is no longer your enemy. It's certainly not a friend. 
but it's a conquered foe. Amen? And the what, what needs to happen now with our understanding of this is that, and I had asked at the beginning if anybody had ever heard this term, the Great Reset. There's a lot of fear out there as to what this entails. Who knows where it's going? There seems to be indicators that this could be the establishment of this final layout as to how things are going to play out in a Revelation 13 type scenario. And that may very well be. And it can cause fear and consternation in the hearts of many people. It doesn't mean that we necessarily have to sweep it under the rug, but what we do need to do is we need to talk about the greatest reset. Because when people bring their fears and their doubts and their anxieties to you and they see things going on in the world, and believe you me, what we've seen so far is just the tip of the iceberg. We're going to see a lot more. But what we have to do as Adventist Christians, what we have to do is we have to follow the instruction of that angel. Go. Go and tell. Go and tell others about the greatest reset. The greatest reset. That death is conquered. Okay? That all that we are challenged with in this life, all that we face in our trials and tribulations, that yes, it doesn't mean that people are not going to have to undergo trials and circumstances and difficulties. But what it does do, it gives people hope and it allows people to know that God in His graciousness has accomplished what the gospel claims. The gospel claims is that Jesus died for our sins. And the fact that the tomb is empty is the evidence that we have that that sacrifice was sufficient. Now, yes, you and I can s s wrestle over this and say, well, where is this empty tomb? I live here in Connecticut. I've never seen this empty tomb. What we do is we go by faith in that this 2,000-year-old document is telling us a truth, and the very fact that this gospel has gone to nearly the uttermost parts of the earth is evidence that the prophecy has proven to be true. What we have to do now, though, is this. We have to answer this question. What is the greatest reset? And what I've attempted to do is to provide that answer. The answer is that God can take poor sinners like us and make us into saints. The question for you and me is, do we see our need for God's greatest reset in my own life? You know, the Passover meal and experience for the children of Israel was a type or a model. And we, by accepting Christ, we can be... Uh, have that same liberating experience of freedom from slavery. And the question that we have to ask ourselves is this, am I in need of a great reset? In other words, do I need to have my sins forgiven? Do I need to be liberated from slavery of sin? That's the question. That's the question. And if you're willing to accept what Christ has done for you, I just want you to just raise your hand. Just acknowledge. Amen. I want God to make a great reset in my life. Amen. Because, it, listen, if we don't, if we don't accept that, the devil has his great reset. So you've got to accept either the devil's or God's. Those are your choice.
and for our, our online audience, you know, put an emoji up there. We'd love to see, hey, that, that you're listening, that you're acknowledging this, that, that you don't want man's great reset. You want God's great reset. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we are so thankful that we have a Redeemer. And there are many who have watched today's message or heard it. And we just pray for them, for their decisions. We pray for our own decisions. We want you to initiate the greatest reset in our lives. That you can take dust and ashes and bring beauty and holiness out of them. So Father, bless us to this end that we would indeed praise you and live a life of praise for you. We thank you for hearing and answering this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.